Oh, guys, good, you're here. I am so excited. Guess what? Uh, I hope this isn't about your podcast again. Why? Did you finally listen to it? The Grimmin' Next Door is recorded in front of a live studio audience. I was looking in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. For my monster farm, Von Fish Slab began to rise and sent away to my surprise. He did the monster mash. He did the mash. The monster mash. The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. He did the mash. Get caught on in a flash. He did the mash. The monster mash. Whoa. From my laboratory in the castle east. Whoa. To the master bedroom with a vampire feast. The ghouls all came from their humble abode to get a joke for my electro. He did the mash, the monster mash. The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. The monster mash. Get caught on in a flash. The monster mash. And he is your host, my mommy and daddy, Chris and Stella Green. Hello, Pups and Kittens, and welcome to episode 99. Wow, that's actually one away from 100. I can't believe we made it this far. Uh, of I the thought we were like four away from 100. Nope, 99. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like that. Of the Gruber Next Door, I'm your co-host, Chris Green. Sitting next to me is the Flying High Sarah. Hello. Well, today we have a very large... And really cool episode for you. Um, later on in the show, we will have Peter Work fly, flying in. Um, he will be landing at the Gruber Next Door studio to actually join us for an interview, which will be really cool. Now, for all of you who actually listened to last week's episode, you'll remember... Wait, people listen to us? No. Oh. Um, but if you did, um, you actually would have heard us talk about a really cool organization called Dog Is My Co-Pilot. It was part of our GND segment last week, and I had said right to you when we were recording, man, it'd be so cool to be able to actually talk to somebody from the organization. Well, we actually have the founder himself. It was just so cool. Um, it was. It's going to be an absolutely amazing interview, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, we will go through our weekly uh, roundup, the GND news. We will play that ge- game that everybody is just loving, and... <laughs> And Sarah's loving to play called <laughs> Guess the Breed. And we have a foster, our foster kitten update. And of course, it is Hal Oween next week. So we want to actually go over some things, um, the do's and don'ts, just in case. So let's dive into the weekly roundup. The weekly roundup, yeehaw. All right, this week on our weekly roundup. Um, I only have one thing that actually stood out for me this week. I don't know about you, but for me, it's again, fleas. Yes, the same dog came in again for a bath. The owner said that uh, he's been scratching, he stinks, he needs a bath. And, uh, okay, come on in for a bath, we'll get him cleaned up. And he is absolutely infested with fleas again. Now, if you remember back... um, Quite a few episodes ago, we were talking about a dog that once it got into the bath, um, the blood that actually was rolling off of the dogs from the actual flea dirt was, oh my gosh, the worst I've ever seen in my life. Um, luckily, was it as bad? I didn't see nothing besides, you know, not that copper floor of water. 
I still had quite a lot, but not as bad, but still. It was bad enough that when you got the face wet, you thought that there was a cut in between yeah, the eyes. It's that, a, he has a lhasa, and most lhasas have a, they don't have a full snout. They're not as smooshed as a shih tzu, but they do have a small snout. And the wrinkles in between the eyes. Well, once you get a bunch of flea dirt there that, you know, gets reanimated and becomes a rust colored again, um, it can give off, a, oh my gosh, there's a cut in there. The dog doesn't want you messing with his face anyways. So he's jerking around, think, you know, making us think that there's something there that's hurting him. Right. And it looked like a very bad laceration. I mean, it it almost had this, um, gosh, I would say, what would you what would you go with? Two centimeters? Three centimeters? Oh, it was it pretty looked, big for me. I mean, it was pretty good size. Well, it's because it was right there in the wrinkle. Right. And the same color as a scab that is... Um, breaking apart can be the same color as the flea dirt um, getting reanimated and um, blood behind it. So you got through it, you washed his face as best as you could, which is pretty darn clean, and once you rinsed it, it, w it went away. Yeah, it was gone. You're like, there was no cut after there all. There was absolutely no cut. Um, so I got a hold of the owner, and this owner, she's trying very hard. She's not somebody that's ignoring what we're telling her. She didn't know she had to keep treating the dog. She thought the one treatment was going to be good for the rest of winter. But, and the fact that she had um, um, an orkin yeah. come in and spray her house. Well, unfortunately, now that the spraying's done, your dog has already been reinfested. In yeah, you got it right. Reinfested. <clears throat> With these fleas, that means they're all over your house again. Or it means that the spraying is working very efficiently, but the fleas are staying to the actual dog, and that's where you get the name flea bag. You know, because <laughs> if you think about way a long time ago, long time ago, you see all these paintings of these kings and queens, and they have these big collars around their neck. Right, it, you know, an e collar or an Elizabethan collar, and that's what they put around dogs to get them to stop chewing on themselves or not to bite. But that collar for people were to catch the bugs from going anywhere else and making sure it doesn't get up in their hair or their face. And then they had a dog on their lap most of the time that if the dog or if they had fleas on them or any kind of bugs on them, it would jump to the dog because the fleas do enjoy dogs more than they do humans. So they draw them off the people and onto the, their flea bag, their dog. Did you I, know that? I, I, I remember you were telling me something about it when I first started. You were like, here's the e-collar, now learn about it. Yeah, Elizabethan collar. Um, Which, that was funny because... <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I was at the vet one time, and <laughs> it was right after I started. I had to take, um, I think I was taking Katana in to get probably uh, comfortness or something. And yes, you're getting her weighed. Is that what it was? And the the lady was saying, "Well, we, you know, we're gonna put the Elizabethan collar on." And I just started laughing inside my head because I'm like, "I know what you mean." <laughs> I, I, how, how ridiculous that may be, well, but most it was. people don't say the Elizabethan collar. Yeah, they normally just say e collar. Right. And it's just a cone uh, that goes around their neck. And groomers, I know quite a few groomers, myself included, that we call it the cone of shame. Yeah. <laughs> And when a dog's biting and it's like a pug or a shih tzu, you can't muzzle them. So you put an e-collar around them and they can't bite you when you trim nails. So you call it the cone of shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My buddy Jeff I used to work with, he, he would echo it. Cone of shame. It was hilarious. You know, take him to you know, take him to outer space or something like that. Look like a big old you know, uh, uh, space helmet. It is funny. You, you go to some um, actual pet stores out there. Um, I know in Springfield, I saw a couple of them where they actually have all sizes of e collars, which I thought was a great thing to have. Yeah, we need to get some. We do. I mean, we have these awesome muzzles that um, the dog can completely open their mouth. They can lick. 
they can breathe, they can they can chew on things, but it's absolutely enclosed to where they can't get to. And us. we had a few biters this week. Yes, we did. Uh, two on one day, if I recall that. Yes, and then the next time it was just as bad. Yep. Yeah. We got our but, share. <laughs> so this this pup that we were originally talking about with the fleas. ADD always happens for us. <laughs> the mom said he wasn't eating right. Something was wrong. He wasn't eating. And I've seen this many a times. Dogs don't want to eat because of the fleas. And because of the fleas, most likely has tapeworm. Tapeworm me messes with their digestive system and can make them either extra hungry or not want to eat at all. So I, we called her. You're, you're also missing something else. Oh. Anemic. Oh, yeah. Um, I know we had a, a clip on our show not too long ago about a veterinarian um, saying that anemia can come from uh, fleas, but very seldom does it ever happen. Well, I don't think she sees the absolute flea infestations like we do out in the country. Right. Um, I think a dog can get or can become very anemic from an infestation of fleas. So. You know, lethargicness and not wanting to move around, not having fun, just everything. Not wanting to eat. Not wanting to eat is all part of it. So she, again, didn't know that you had to treat the dog again. Um, we have topical treatment at work that we can we could have sold her. But I told Keith that he needs a comfortist pill because that will kick in within 30 minutes. I said he needs it now. He does not need to wait two days before putting the, the Comfortus or the Avantix on. I said, we need to just make sure that we don't sell her the product and she goes and gets what she needs right away. Um, sure enough, she was okay with it and Keith was willing to take the dog to the vet for her since she was a little lady that can't drive. So Keith took the dog to the veterinarian and gave him both the pills. So he should be set for another month. Um, we have it written down so that we know when he's due for another set of flea medicine that we can go ahead and tell her. Right. Um, either one of us will just run it over to her so we can put it on a few days after the grooming. Something. So we can make sure this dog stays flea free and happy. Um, so hopefully. <laughs> hopefully it'll all work out. See, but a lot of people think. Um, because it snows here, that all they have to do is treat their dog up to the first hard freeze. And for the folks like me who lived in California doesn't know what the heck a first hard freeze means. I still it, don't know what it means. It I means just don't, I, it, I hide. It, it means when it hits below 30 degrees and it stays that way for a, for a while. And that's a hard freeze and it stays frozen. So it kills off any bugs that are left out. Um, that's why we don't have flies or mosquitoes or anything like that because it all kills them during that time. But for well, all of you who don't have that kind of uh, climate, yeah. you're actually going to deal with it a lot more. And fleas are all year round. Well, unfortunate part is, is that inside your house normally doesn't get below freezing for multiple days on end. You know, we have to have it above a certain temperature just for us to live. So since it's above a certain temperature for us to live, it's above a certain temperature for the fleas to live. So then, therefore, you have fleas all year round. And that? You have to keep treating yep. all through winter. It's, it's an old wives tale. Oh, I'll just treat up until, you know, December. And then January, February, March, I'm I'll good. go without. You're right. And that's not the case. It's not true. So hopefully that helps all of you who are in nice warm climate throughout the year especially our, our listeners in Southern California. Trust me, I remember when it was, uh, you know, 50 degrees, wearing a big old jacket going, it's too cold for me. Um, but there's going to be a lot of us out here who are going to be seeing minus degrees or worse. Yeah, 32 degrees, I'm out there with flip-flops. You are. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on because we have a very big show ahead of us today. So let's move on to, uh, let's go with Foster Kitty Update. This is the Groomer Next Door Adoption Corner. Alright, 
right, well, we have an update on our foster situation. Now, as, as you guys have heard, we have been fostering a kitten. Um, it, uh, well, its name was... Kit. Kit? Kit. Well, that was his, his oh, oh, okay. Name. His original name was Kit. Then Claire, while we were fostering, named him Whiskers. But he actually gained a new name called Winchester. And we are happy to announce... He has been adopted. Yes, he's been adopted. I I was sad, but I'm also happy. Yep. Um, Keith, the owner of the shop... He has been saying how he wanted a um, another animal, um, Buddy another, another shop shop another, animal. Sh another shop animal. Uh, Buddy and Spike are getting rather old. Um, Spike still has several years left in him. He's just as spunky as me. <laughs> um, but Buddy, uh, he's there. He's had fading health for the last year, and it's getting worse quickly. Yeah. But um, Keith wanted, you know, he, he never, he's always had his eyes open just in case there was that right pet that came along that was going to be perfect for our shop. Well, I kept bringing, um, at the time, Whiskers, who was his name, in for... Um, just we would bring him in every day <coughs> from, from work. We'd bring him from home to work. That way he was able to, you know, stay with us. We didn't have to worry about a kitten chewing up wires. And if, we didn't have to worry that. about our other animals or him picking on my other animals or Katana getting too rough like she does with Rambo and because um, Rambo and Katana have a special relationship and Rambo had a very, very hard time with this kitten. Very much so. And he even had a hard time with Katana giving this other kitten attention. Yeah, yeah. So we just knew it was best to give Rambo a break during the day and take the kitten with us. Well, by taking the kitten with us, he just does all the super cutest things in the world. When he sleeps, he's on his back and his little paws cover his face, exposing just his itty bitty nose. Uh, when he wakes up, he has these Asian squinty eyes. They're just absolutely just adorable. And he purrs every time you walk in the room. He is just so happy to see you. And you touch him and he's just on, on top of purring like nobody's business and Keith really wanted a calico but he's also the type that knows for a fact that the animal picks you you don't pick the animal so even though you might want a calico female there might be an um, orange and white male that likes you so finally he just him and Lori was like you know what we love him so much he's been a joy to have he's absolutely just loving him go and sit up on your chest when you're not asking for it and he wants to be with you he that's that type of cat um and they came out to me and they they asked we want to adopt him so all right that's it so they changed his name from whiskers to winchester and now they call him winnie for short so he's been dewormed he's got his rabies shots he's um spayed or yeah neutered, neutered. And he has a next appointment for all his regular shots. Yep. And he gets to get out of the crate or the kennel and sit in front of the window on a nice sunny day. Um, he already had one introduction to a dog and he took off pretty quickly. <laughs> Rhett. Yeah. <laughs> Rhett came out and, and, and said hello very loudly and he took off. So he knew that's his safe spot. So you get in there if there's a dog that comes in. So he's already starting to get trained. Yep. So and we get to see him every day. We do. So we're proud to announce that our foster kitten has been adopted. That's about six adoptions that we've had at least. I think we're a little bit higher than six this year um, that we've fostered and uh, or given a home to as a temporary housing. So our numbers are a little lower than what I like, but I was gone for part of the summer. So, I, you mm -hmm. know, it's to be expected. So that's I, a good thing. And thank you very much, Shelly, for all you've done. And thank you, Kim, for taking them out for transport. Yep. All right, let's move on to GND News. All right, this week on GND News, we're going to actually change up our format a little bit just because um, it's Halloween. Um, so, Halloween. 
So we wanted to actually switch it up and instead of actually have clips of different things that are going on in the news, you know, around the country, we decided that we would actually be the ones to do some of the talking because some of the things were, you know, more vocal, they were kind of tailored to what we wanted to talk about. Every once in a while, we can get to, you know, doing some of the funny stuff, some of the the trendy stuff it doesn't always have to be you know facts well we don't have a we have no program design how we do this well but most of the time when we do the the news it's it's like you said the stuff all over the world every once in a while we want to just stop with the world and have get into the cute stuff the yeah. stuff that might not matter or anything have a point to it but you know it's cute it's fun and let's it's go great. So I had to actually mention this. I was uh, reading the other day, um, and it kind of goes into our um, next guest that will come on a little later. But um, <laughs> there's um, the very first, <clears throat> excuse me, very first airport in the United States that actually will have a doggy bathroom. And I, I asked Sarah, I go, hey, can you take a guess? And I loved your guess because you had the right idea. You you chose SFO, which is San Francisco International Airport, which is not actually that airport, but that was a good choice. My first choice would have been LAX, which is Los Angeles International Airport. But in fact, it was a third airport, and I'm not surprised. Chicago O'Hare is the one that actually is going to be featuring a bathroom now for canines. Which I thought was a good idea. I just wonder, will they have toilets? Will they have artificial <laughs> grass? What? It's probably artificial grass that they can hose down and um, clean out and sterilize. And I, you know, I just thought that was really cool. So I thought, hey, you know what? I, I, I wanted to mention that during our actual news portion because that was really cool. But our main topic is, going, like we said, Halloween. So we're going to go over a couple different things, whether it's the do's or don'ts. Um, and the top costumes this year for your pups. So, are you ready? Yep. All right. First, the number one, and not a surprise, the number one costume for your dog this Halloween is Darth Vader. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not surprised with the upcoming Star Wars movie that this has not become the big top seller. It's not surprising at all. I would have loved to address one of our dogs up as Darth Vader. So, that was cool. The second, which also not a real surprise, here was a movie that came out this summer, and all the kids love it, and it's a top kid costume as well, Minion. What's so. crazy about the Minion thing, it, that's been going on for years now. Yeah. And Minions have been just everywhere for, what, the last four or five years? Something like that, ever since Despicable Me came out, yeah, Despicable Me actually created the Minion concept, and what's funny about that is... They didn't even really think about the Minion just taking off as being such a big character. So it was just a side character that became its own entity, which I thought that was pretty cool. Now, the third character I thought was a little odd because I don't really see these books out anymore. Um, it was a book that was really big when Sarah and I were kids, but not so much now. The third top costume right now for 2015 is the Waldo. The Waldo what? pet costume. I thought that was weird. You know, they do wear, Where's Waldo at the uh, Springfield Cardinals game. But I don't know if they do that in other ballparks. Well, the or people, even, even arenas. There's people that dress up as Waldo and, and the chick Waldo as a combined costume. You yeah. know? I, I thought it was I think interesting. Even though Waldo isn't very important nowadays, it's just oh, that it's they were such important. a staple to us when yeah. we were younger that now all of us are now older and able to buy stuff and, and spend money are now really into the idea and they're retro retroing it. Well, you know, the the geek fashion has become what's called, you know, it used to be geek fashion, geek trend, is now what's trending. That's what everybody wants, which leads me up to the number four costume, which... Now, on this picture, it looks more like the Adam West Batman with the gray and the blue cape. That's more of the Adam the West. The yellow belt. Yeah, the yellow utility belt, which I still like that costume over any of them, but that's just me. Now, I thought this was weird, considering number one was Darth Vader. Number five was Yoda. Yoda. 
I would put above minions. I, I, I would, would put, put that above it. Darth Vader. Yes, yes, because I love Yoda. I think everybody but. loves Yoda, so I thought that was weird. <laughs> now, the number six costume, I'm a little surprised because I, I think it's the revamp that's actually coming up with the uh, all-female cast. But number six is the Ghostbuster pet costume. I think it's only re you know revisited because you know there's so much talk that there's going to be an all female and then there's going to be an another all male cast. You know they wanted to do all these different Ghostbuster movies, so it's inspired people to actually want these again. Number seven, which I thought you know in order, I thought it was a little odd. Robin, the Boy Wonder, Batman sidekick, being number seven. Now again, here we go back to, you know, number eight, it kind of follows the trend, an Ewok for pet costume, which... And that one's so cute. I would is. put that one above a lot of these. Uh, yeah, I thought that was weird. Number nine, I thought was a little out of order, a little weird to me, because it had nothing to do with anything we we're talking about, but a shark costume has been selling well, high. If it starts walking and you take a look of it, look at it above, you know, since dogs are walking, It'll they walk. look like it's just uh, swimming out yeah. of nowhere. So it is kind of entertaining. And the number 10 on the list is a Stegosaurus. Now I can see that <laughs> with the recent success of the Jurassic World movie coming out this year. I can see where a dinosaur costume actually would have been a, probably a really big success. So, uh, you know, I'm going to put this out there. I'm curious what you guys are all going to dress your dogs up as, if anything. If you um, want to send us an email, tell us what your dog's going to be a picture. Send us a picture. Let us know. You can, you know, email us at thegroomernextdoor at yahoo.com or find us on Facebook and you can actually post a picture on our Facebook wall. Love to see pictures of your dogs. That would be kind of cool. Now, one thing people need to realize, too, is when you dress your dog up for Halloween, you have to keep in mind your climate. Um, if you're in anywhere where it's really hot and yes. you're able to go trick-or-treating in a tank top, then buying your dog and putting your dog in a full-on costume might not be very yeah. smart. Probably not. Because you'll overheat them. Now, if you're in a place like where we are, and if you dress up your dog in a full-on costume, the dog will probably be pretty all right. Um, since I don't think we're supposed to get out of the 60s on Halloween. I think we're going to be pretty low. low, yeah. low 60s. We always are. <laughs> and it's like perfect, you know, nice weather now. It's kind of chilly out, but not bad. But I'm pretty sure Halloween is going to be extremely chilly. So just keep in mind um, what the temperature is going to be like outside. Um, if you're early, if you have early trick or treaters, you know, young kids that go out a lot sooner than some of the other kids, and you bring your dog along, make sure that your dog is okay to be around other people with costumes on. Right. Some dogs get freaked out. Like Sydney did with the zombies. zombies. Sydney yeah. got freaked out with the zombie sound, and since she is already part blind, it freaked her out. Right. Um. Roxy doesn't do well on Halloween. Um, Roxy does not like masks. Roxy does not like big, flashy things. So, Roxy spends a very slow and quiet time in the bedroom. Stress-free. Stress-free. With the TV on. <laughs> with the TV on and all the other dogs with her. And her nice, big pet bed. Yep. Uh, so, just make sure you're using your common sense here because you don't want to take a dog out that's already high strung around people in different clothing that's not normal and hyped up on sugar. Right. And the other thing that you have to look at is, and this is something that I really was kind of thinking about, any kind of headpiece piece that you're going to put on your dog, mask that, you know, like little, uh, like the Batman little mask, kind of the head cowl. Um, hat. Yeah, anything. Make sure that your dog, uh, yeah, make sure your dog actually is willing to wear it because, or even used to wearing it. Because when you think about it, dogs aren't used to wearing hats. They're not used to wearing anything. Their their fur is their clothes, and they wear it every day. So be prepared that if you if you've actually already bought the costume for your dog, and you've already put it on your dog, and you know worked through it, that's great. And your dog's used to it, but. Don't put it on day of and expect your dog out of nowhere to be saying, "Oh, hey, I'm okay with wearing a hat and a mask on my over my eyes and all kinds of different things. This is all normal." No, it's not. You will stress them out 
Oh yeah. And you'll stress out yourself because you're trying to get them to look super adorable. Uh huh. And you know dogs don't really need help looking super ador adorable. They already are. Um, you don't want to stress them out. You don't want to cause problems, and you don't want to overheat them. And especially if your dog's older, then you're really going to cause a great deal of problems. If it's a puppy, then you, you can work with it. But if this is just, hey, we're going to go to a contest and, uh, you know, my dog's super cute. I'm going to take him and I'm going to buy this costume and it has this really cool headpiece to put on him. And, you know, we're going to latch him with this thing on the belly and over this arm. If they're just used to a simple harness and nothing else, they're, they're going to look at you and go, what are you doing to me? Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly it. And, you know, if you want them to wear cute costumes, start young and do it throughout the year. Put a shirt on them, do stuff like that throughout the year. Just make sure you brush them out yes. so that they don't get knotted. Um, and if it's a lab or something like that, uh, make sure you de shed them because you don't want all that hair getting stuck there. You want the hair to be able to come out naturally. Um, precautions so. yeah there's a lot there's a lot of do's and don'ts when it comes to this so that's why you know if you haven't already started working this out with your dog then you're probably already a little late because they're not going to be ready for it in just a couple days now other things to watch out for is of course the treats you know dogs will you know they're going to get into anything Ooh, that smells good let me look at it first thing you want to look out for is diet treats there are sugars that are in artificial sweeteners that are in there that could be very harmful to your dog. Yeah, and any can, kind of aspartame. Yep, exactly. And it could cause uh, and it just it, it it could cause radical drops in your dog's blood pressure, cause liver damage, and even death. So that's one of the one of them for any kind of diet candies that are out there. Those sodium, those uh, sugar-free kind of candies um, that could be a real problem. Uh, of course, and well, this arti is... artificial sweeteners are not even good for humans. Yeah, they're terrible. Look at look at they give you migraines. Oh my gosh! Yeah, a... If I have a diet soda or a diet coke or anything that has aspartame in it, I get I start vomiting. Yeah. I get massive migraines, and oh, it is just horrendous. I one time had a soda from I think like Arby's or something like that yeah and they gave me do diet Dr. Pepper so Dr. Pepper and I was like whatever I'm just gonna drink it I, I'm too busy at work yeah I that was a bad day halfway through a medium size and I was puking up everywhere yeah I had a headache hope you're not oh. not eating folks sorry <laughs> If you're listening to a dog show, you probably don't want to be eating because you never know if we're talking about tapeworms or anal glands. <laughs> um, another one to look out for is, of course, chocolate. You know, um, dogs and chocolate, they're, it's just terrible. Dark chocolate especially. Um, yeah, some people think, um, okay, I don't want to downplay milk chocolate, but if your dog eats one M&M, two M&Ms, I'm not going to freak out. Don't freak out. It's okay. Just don't let it happen Unless any it's more than that. Dark chocolate. I'm getting there. Okay, sorry. Milk chocolate <laughs> is a dilution. Uh, it dilutes the actual cocoa that's been put into it, so it's more of a milky and a sugary treat with a hint of chocolate, um, hint of cocoa. The dark chocolate, when you get into the specialty, like uh, the dark chocolate nuggets that you get from Hershey's or something, um, your dog downs one of those. I would definitely be thinking about taking them to the emergency room. Emergency uh, bed. Bed. Same thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, the co higher concentration of cocoa is what does it for the dog. The cocoa bean is what hurts the dog. And the darker the chocolate, the more toxic it is to them. Um, if you go out and I know you and I, we go and get the super dark chocolate for our migraines. Yep. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but caffeine and dark chocolate um, give you a caffeine rush to deal, you know, get your migraine under control. So we go and get the the dark chocolate that's like 90% dark. Yeah, it's it's really dark chocolate. But but we are very careful to make sure that is nowhere near our dogs. Right. Because a little bit of that to our chihuahua 
and kill her. Right. Now the next thing to avoid is grapes and raisins. Your your dog can eat grapes and raisins without suffering any ill effects. Others can end up uh, affected with kidney failure and even death. So it's kind of one of those 50 50s you know you don't want to take the risk um, some dogs can just be fine with it i would imagine probably the smaller dogs would have more of a problem but then again it's hard to really you know guess it so try to keep it away from your dogs at best um, beware of macadamia nuts um, you probably won't get many of these in your kids treat bags in case you do immediately put them away macadamia macadamia nuts um, have been found to trigger have been found to trigger not only a diarrhea and vomiting in dogs, but also hind leg weakness and fleeting paralysis. So that is weird. So I was like, really, macadamia? But then again, you think about the chocolate that's uh, from like Hilo Hattie. Um, if you have a Hawaiian store, I was thinking about the one at the block, or if you're in Hawaii, um, or you. Any, anyway, you can get that in stores as well, but uh, definitely worry about that. Oh, well, that that's really I love white chocolate macadamia nut cookies. Yeah. But there again, I make sure that I am nowhere near my dogs because my dogs are scavengers. <laughs> you drop something, they're going to eat it. Yeah. Whether they spit it out three seconds later is um, another story. But for the most part, um, be very careful, especially yep. you're around dogs that actually eat human food. <laughs> yeah. Another thing, now, I, I've actually never had act problems with this, but uh, be careful about pennies. Uh, don't allow your dog access to pennies. People don't only get uh, give out candies and cookies or treats. Some hand out coins because some dogs will eat almost anything. Make sure that your pup doesn't ingest coins as they can cause severe anemia as well as kidney blockage and of course probably if it's small enough dog gets stuck in a trach and well chokes and dies yeah i don't i don't know about coins i mean that's I've just a general, I've general been... rule you don't yeah. let your dogs eat money well yeah but i mean a coin drops on the floor there might be you know some candy remnants near it you know maybe because even... there's dogs that eat anything there's yeah, dogs that eat socks underwear toy soldiers yeah yep. there's lots of things um, you know, it, it, this is one of those, you know, duh, but, you know, obviously in the moment you won't remember, think about it, but don't leave anything harmful, any objects that are harmful near your dogs. You know, sharp knives on the counter. Again, it's that whole, the dog is a three-year-old, so if it jumps up on the counter, it's not going to realize that there's a sharp knife there. That maybe you were cutting apples to give apple slices out, so just or think about that. you're in the middle of carving pumpkins, put the pumpkin down for a minute. There you go. And don't let scary visitors, which we've all already talked about, but scary visitor mischievous, mischievous behavior uh, with people approach your dog. So like kids, that you know, kids are kids. They're going to see a dog. It's cute. You want to go up and you want to see, let's go say hi. Then this child's going to run up, hi doggy doggy, and run up to it. Your dog will frighten you, unless it's used to it, like ours. <laughs> well, our dogs aren't, aren't used not, not to, to someone dressed up as a zombie. That's true. Or with the big huge mask on, coming up and say, "Ooh, pretty doggy." Yeah. Um, you want to make sure that you don't frighten your dog. Don't do it on purpose. Artifact. Well, exactly. I mean, I saw some videos online of somebody wearing like a wolf mask, and their cat was just going just nuts over it. You know, it's funny for the first minute or two, but that's it. You know, you stop and you had your laugh, let it go. You got it on and YouTube, and you're happy. <laughs> but don't keep doing it. You're going to give the dog a heart attack. You're going to scar the cat for life. Yeah. Don't. You know, there's funny and there's tasteless. Don't take it to the tasteless part. And the last thing is don't leave your, your dog wearing any costumes un un unsupervised. Exactly. Because, you know, like that <laughs> mask we were talking about that goes over the eyes. Ooh, I'm going to chew on it and digest it. And I'm going to eat it and I'm going to tear up this this um, flapping arm on the side of me because I don't know it's a costume. It looks like a toy to me. Uh -huh. So then they end up ingesting it. And, oh, the cotton everywhere. Or if there's any kind of, you know, buttons. Velcro. and Yeah, it could be bad. So these are just a few little things that we thought, you know, we would actually bring up to you. And, you know, have a ha have a very safe Halloween. That concludes GND News, I think, for this week. Yes? All right.
All right, it's that time again of the week. <laughs> it is Guess the Breed. Guess the Breed. With your host, Chris Green. Okay, now as the rules go, I'm going to give you a series of questions and you're not going to blurt out like you did last week, right? <laughs> last week, you actually blurted out the answer even though, <laughs> I don't know how you pulled that one off. I didn't tell you, I never do. So the rules are, I will name off a bunch of characteristics of this dog and you will try to guess the breed. Is our contestant ready? Yes. Okay. Time on the clock starts now. <laughs> Okay, height of this dog is between 9 and 11 inches. Its origin is the Canary Islands of Spain, Belgium, and later had success in France. The coat is medium length, soft, silky, texture with corkscrew curls. Lifespan is 12 to 15 years, and it is a hypoallergenic dog. Do you have any ideas? Mm, kinda. Okay. Would you have? Do you have a question for me? You are allowed three questions. <laughs> what color is it? White. Only. Only. Okay. Um. Is there a particular haircut to get? Yes. Is it a Bichon? Yes, it is a Bichon. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for playing it. <laughs> Name the breed. Well, I want to thank you, Peter, for actually joining us. Um, you actually are a pilot and part of Dog Is My Co-Pilot, which is an amazing organization, which we had talked about in our previous podcast. And I reached out to you guys actually the day of recording, I think, to actually you know talk to somebody from your organization. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, the organization is Dog Is My Co-Pilot. I started the organization about three and a half years ago that uh, tragically began with the death of my wife. Oh, no. And uh, I had practiced orth as an orthopedic surgeon in Jackson Hole, Wyoming for over 20 years. And uh, when she died, I just didn't have the heart for medicine anymore. Now, I have always been a pilot. I you have to be 16 years old to first fly an airplane by yourself and i did that on my 16th birthday you have to be 17 to get your license i did that on my 17th birthday and all through uh, college um, i kept flying and i got my commercial pilot's license but uh, honestly flying the straight and level stuff can get pretty dull after a while and i needed something more stimulating so I had an opportunity to go to medical school, so I uh, went to medical school in Baltimore at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and uh, kept flying all through that. Actually, I worked my way through med school, teaching flying and doing charter work and sightseeing tours over the Chesapeake Bay. So my hand was always in it and uh, went off to my internship and residency and uh, flying got a little bit slower. Um, but I still continue to fly. I had my own airplane at that time. Um, and then when I got into private practice, I had some local groups reaching out to me, knowing that I was a pilot, asking me if I would fly an animal from A to B or B to C or be part of a, of a sequence of flights to move an animal over a longer distance. And there's an organization called Pilots and Paws, which uses that as a model to identify a dog, say, in um, Chattanooga that needs to get to Boise. So they'll line up five or six pilots and each one will do a leg and move the animal along. If you think about it though, that is a lot of resource expended for one animal. Not that that's a bad thing, but 
I thought there was a better way. So uh, after doing a couple of those flights, and I could see how really expensive it was and getting so little bang for your buck, as it were, um, I, I did a couple more flights trying to get more and more dogs on board. And then after my wife passed away, I contacted Judy Zimmett, who's an attorney who specializes in nonprofits. And I, I'd known Judy for a number of years. And I asked her to help me get this thing going. So she was the co-founder with me. And uh, she is now the executive director and actually functions as ground control for all the flights. She does all the pre-flight uh, coordination from the senders to the receivers, uh, make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and uh, before we fly those flights because we don't want to launch off on an expedition and come back empty because it, it's just too expensive to do that. So we developed a model where we will fly uh, larger groups of animals and we ask for three animals for every flight hour. And with the current aircraft that we have, that costs us about $75 per animal per transport, which is in line with what the shelters are paying to take these dogs in, getting their health checks, getting the spay and neuter. Um, so we figure we'll, we'll stay in that same financial ballpark. And we started out slowly and really kind of learning as we went along. But now we've saved over 3,000 animals that we've flown. We get them primarily out of New Mexico, Arizona, and California, where they they have very high kill facilities with an, an adoption rate, mm -hmm. sometimes less than 5%. And so we'll fly in. We'll load as many animals as we can. I've had as many as 84 animals on board at one time. And then we fly them to either the shelter or a uh, an organization of fosters that will never, ever put down a healthy animal. So uh, we rely strictly on uh, donations, and uh, we're a nonprofit. And uh, I had no idea what nonprofit meant until mm -hmm. I started one, and there's definitely no profit in it. <laughs> but it's a labor of love. I mean, I, I was an orthopedic surgeon for over 30 years, and I was taking care of people's messes up to that point. But if you think about it, this isn't a dog problem. This is a people problem. Yes. And people have created this problem. And so I thought, well, after I left medicine, I'm going to be a pilot full-time again for this nonprofit. It'll be different. It's really kind of the same thing. Still taking care of people's problems. But that's okay. Uh, dogs don't have a voice. And it's people like you who give the dogs a voice. I try to give the dogs a voice. Judy tries to give the dog a voice. And um, that's where my heart is right now. And I've, we've dedicated, we started this three and a half years ago. When I first started it, I said, I'm going to do this for at least 10 years to get it right. And I think it's taken us about two or three years to get the formula correct. But we really have it wired now. The, the only thing that holds us back at this point are groups that are willing to take the animals because there's no shortage of animals to fly and weather. And, you know, during the winter months when it's a little bit more harsh, sometimes it's more difficult. But we have a flight plan for tomorrow. I called Judy and I said we have a weather window open for the next couple of days. So I'll be off to California tomorrow and then flying dogs up to Boise. Wow. So, you, are, you are definitely a go-getter. I mean, there is no shortage of go-getter for you. I mean, I'm thinking 16 years old, I was nowhere near where you are. I, I, I can think of 16, it's you, you're thinking, I'm going to get my driver's license. Your motto was, I'm going to you know, be a pilot. I mean, that, that's just... You know, it's interesting you say that because I was born and raised in the state of New Jersey. And... Uh, New Jersey, you have to be 17 to have your pilot's or your driver's license. And actually, on your 17th birthday, you go and you apply for a permit. You get your appointment for your driver's test some two months later. And then, uh, on my so my 17th birthday, I applied for my driver's permit. I got my pilot's license. And I used to tell people who were older than me, hey, give me a ride to the airport and I'll take you fine. 
So it was just completely backward of, of what I... So I've been a pilot longer than I've been a driver. Now, what do you find harder, driving a vehicle or flying a plane? Oh, driving a vehicle, <laughs> definitely. I mean, you just... Uh, although it has an advantage that if the engine quits, you just kind of coast and pull the, to the side of the road. I had an engine failure on my way to pick up some animals a couple years ago. And they say, you know, the propeller on the front of an airplane is, is just simply a sand to keep the pilot cool because you should see him sweat when it stops. I believe it. Yeah. Wow. Well, that turned out okay. I was landed on an off airport, but uh, uh, the airplane wasn't damaged and everything was fine and, you know, got a new engine in it and took off. Well, you know, being that you've actually... You grew up in New Jersey. You've driven in New York. Um, I've never been in New York, but I've heard the traffic is terrible. I drove in California, Los Angeles. That's the worst possible traffic you can ever see in your life. So I oh, can it's, it's that. absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I remember when I was in medical school and I was doing a lot of teaching, uh, teaching flying, and I was on my pediatric rotation for three months in downtown Baltimore. And the attending on the, on the program uh, was crazy about sailing. And, of course, I was flying over the Chesapeake Bay 10 hours a day every Saturday and Sunday. And, and I would look down and I'd see all these hundreds and hundreds of sailboats. And really, one day, I asked my attending, and I said, you know, I look down and see all those sailboats, and I wonder, how can you guys not run into each other? He says, you know, Peter, I look up in the sky and think the same thing about you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I, I'm gonna go okay. with you. Okay. I'll go yeah. with yours for sure. I, I've I've seen you know off the Long Beach or out in Balboa, uh, even even down in the, the Santa Monica Pier. There's boats everywhere. I think the same thing. How do you not hit each other? Yeah, yeah. Well, they do actually. They do hit each other. I bet. But it just doesn't make the news the way it does on airplane city. Well, of course. So, now you know. So in any event, our our nonprofit never charges the senders. It never charges the receivers. We want to facilitate as much transport as possible. I'm typically flying three days a week, and um, then I'm home with my two dogs, which are both rescues. And um, we we want to fly as many animals as possible. As a matter of fact, next week I'm off to Wichita, Kansas, for 10 days of training in a new aircraft, which will be able to carry three times the number of animals they were nice. carrying now. And it's uh, so we're excited about that. We uh, we've got the formula; it's working well. We, uh, we could use some more donations, but that's true for every nonprofit. And honestly, uh, you know, I, whenever I go to, to the airports and I fly in, you know, they call me Peter the Pilot. Everybody wants to talk to Peter the Pilot. Here comes the, the, you know, the television lens and then the radio folks such as yourself. But really the heroes here are those people who go to those shelters every day and mm -hmm. deal with those animals every single day and call the animals out of those kill facilities and put them in foster homes, keep that coordinated, bring them to the airport, adopt the animals out. Uh, they don't get a day off. They're dealing with it every single day. And those are the real, those are the real heroes of the animal rescue world. But it has to start somewhere. It does start somewhere. You do bring these, these dogs to all over, and these people couldn't get to these dogs. So you're bringing them. So you're really the shepherd of it all. That is an amazing... Well, you know, it's, 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 it's what one of the... If, if it's anything that we're able to do, it's, it's the long-distance transport. And that, that's an excellent point you just made. Where if the shelter in Merced, California, is overloaded, which they always are, and the shelter, the animal rescue facility up in San Francisco has room, they can drive the animals to San Francisco. Yes. That's a two-hour drive. Put them in a van, and off they go. To drive them up to Seattle or drive them to Denver or drive them to Missoula, this is 16 or 18 hours in a van, and it's, and it's not as if they're stopping every three hours to let these animals go out and pee. Mm -hmm. I mean, these animals are not fed the night before. They're put in this crate. 
They're put in the back of a van. They're driven 18 hours. The poor people up front driving it have to get them get the animals there just as quickly as practical for the health of the animals. Mm -hmm. And I can knock that flight off in four hours. So it's uh, it really expands the geographic region that these animal rescue groups are able to transport or really moving the merchandise. The dogs aren't being adopted, Merced. They, they fly off the shelves in Missoula. They're not being adopted in Roswell. They fly off the shelves in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in Phoenix, they're getting in 100 animals a day. Uh, Boise, Idaho takes them in like crazy. So it's that's what that's what Doug is my co-pilot has been able to do. Now it's not as if these facilities haven't in the past done these long distance transports, but we've eliminated that need and that stress on the individual and on the on the animals. And we can carry as many animals, and actually, pretty soon, we're going to be able to carry more. So that's, that's that, good. and you, you know, we were talking about this before we actually started recording. You were part of the actual New Mexico Utah uh, transport that I had posted in our last podcast. You were actually the pilot on that flight. Yes, I'm. I'm the chief pilot and bottle washer for Doug as my co-pilot. We have one airplane and one pilot, and we're flying the wings off that thing but that was a flight out of roswell new mexico they have a um a seven day window and then they'll destroy the animal and okay. so the there's a gal uh jen o'connor and uh carolyn drakovich uh jen is in denver carolyn is down in roswell and these women are tireless in their efforts to get these animals out of there and it's, I love working with these women. They are organized, they are on time, they make my job so much easier. We all have stress going on, we're, we're, we have a lot of self-imposed pressure to get these transports done. We don't need any outside pressure. Mm. Uh, we, we uh, as you said, we're, we're motivated, we're motivated because the dogs did not ask to be put in this situation. Now, I have two rescue dogs, and I just can't imagine my life without them. They have just, I've always had dogs my entire life. But um, these dogs that I have now, uh, they're, they're just, they're family. And so uh, we've transported over 3,000 animals, and that's 3,000 homes that are now getting to enjoy that same kind of of input that a dog in the house will bring and so I, I feel good that we're able to have that uh, impact not only on saving the dogs but changing the lives of some of these families and, and children who will grow up with dogs mm -hmm. one of the interesting programs that we are involved with is called critter camp and this is with laura o'connor out of the uh, western montana humane society of western montana they're based in uh, Missoula, and every summer they have a week-long camp where I'll fly 40 dogs up from Merced, land at the Missoula airport. The kids will come out to the airport. They help unload. They're assigned an animal. They groom the animal. They socialize with the animal, and then they adopt out the animal, To and, and this is a day camp for them, and there's, they're packed every time they open up the registration boom like within an hour they're they're full and what better way than to get somebody involved in animal rescue than to start with an eight-year-old mm -hmm. so our, our six-year-old has been involved in animals since day one and that's that's where she's at yeah it's just terrific and to be part of that you know then then it multiplies it just, uh, you know, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. Now, I, I would be absolutely out of line not to ask this question. What kind of dogs do you have? Well, I have a black lab that was a throwaway. He was a Doyle is his name. He was a fully trained hunting dog. You heard him barking at the beginning of our, our interview. He was sitting in my back of my car with me. Um, he's a black lab, injured his elbow. 
they threw him away because he couldn't keep up with the other dogs. Oh, no. And I'm thinking, okay, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Mm. This dog is fine. Holy smokes. And then uh, a year and a half ago, I had a friend reach out about a dog down in Arizona whose who, owner had him since he was a pet, and this dog was now 11 years old, 11 and a half at the time. And he decided he wanted to travel, so he was going to, he gave the dog to his brother, and his brother said, well, if I can't find a home for him in a week, I'm going to take him to the pound. Now, who is going to adopt a black dog that's 11 and a half years old from a pound? That, it's like a death sentence. It is. And, and so I, a sight unseen, actually, I sent Judy over because Judy, the, my executive director, is, uh, practices out of Arizona. Her office is down in Scottsdale. I said, Judy, go check this dog out and tell me what you think. So she goes over. She says, the dog is really great. I said, okay, I'll take it. So put him on the plane. When I, on my next rescue flight out of Scottsdale, he was my co-pilot, sat on the seat right next to me, and I've had him ever since. So, and his name is Wendell. So it's, uh, yeah. So I have Wendell and Doyle, and, and these guys are just, they're like shadows, you know? They're, oh, yes. They can't go on the long walks with me anymore, but and but they, they're they always ready to go, even. So I always take them for a shorter walk and then kind of sneak out later. Do they go on any of your flights with you? You know, I used to uh, take Doyle on a lot of flights, but uh, I have a a caretaker who watches my dogs when I travel, mm -hmm. because if I take Doyle, that's four fewer animals that I can transport. Gotcha. Because yeah. uh, I can stick four crates up in the front right seat, and uh, one down by the by the feet, and then three stacked up on the on the seat. And Doyle, I'll see him when I get home. But this is four additional animals. Now, do you so find? I, I, do you ever find yourself getting into a certain city and you're like, I'm going to stay the night just because it's good food, good atmosphere, or you're just, you know, touch down and lift right back up? Oh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we let them go. Uh, typically, we'll, during the summer when the days are long, I'll frequently make four or five stops because not every foster organization can take 40 dogs. Mm -hmm. They might be able to take 10. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop in uh, Salem, Oregon, mm -hmm. Capoose, Oregon, Vancouver, Washington, Sandpoint, Idaho, Libby, Montana, and then home. And usually, and there's a gal, uh, Lynette Duford, who runs an animal rescue right here in Polson, Montana, where, where I am right now. And uh, I always bring one or two dogs in for her. But these are these are the dogs that are a train wreck. They're missing a limb. They don't. They only have one eye. They've got terrible mange. She only wants the ones that no one else wants. And she turns these animals around. And oh my God, this woman is a sweetheart. And just oh, one of those unsung heroes. And I'm talking about these are the people who aren't being. Uh, always interviewed on television, you know, they, they look at the, the airplane that flies in with the animals, but they, what we like to do is that we like the people to take a picture when they first get them, we like the before and after stuff, mm -hmm. and we have on our website, in our Facebook page, a, a lot of the before and after photos, and so our, our web page is www.dogcopilot.org. And our Facebook page is Dog is My Co-Pilot, Inc. And so you can see a lot of the postings from the trip. Judy is just terrific in keeping all that up to date. Uh, I'll frequently take a selfie in the airplane with one of the dogs because I usually like to have one as my co-pilot up front with me and send it to Judy, and she'll post that while we're in the air. And uh, we have almost 7,000 likes on our on our Facebook page. So we have a lot of uh, followers and um, a lot of people interested. So we're just trying to get the word out. And I'm so grateful that you asked me uh, to chat with you because 
this is you understand what the problem is i do and you also understand what the solution is and you know i i've i've been a fan of yours for a while it's not it's not because you are on news not because you're known i you know i i only pick people to talk to that i'm interested in and i just you know i could i've told you before i could sit here and just talk to you all day about baseball and sports and travel and and the dogs and and hearing about emaciated dogs all over and how there's the lack of spay and neuter or even education when you buy a dog what breed you're buying and what health defects do they have what's their lifespan what is you know, there's so many questions and people just go ooh, pretty and it drives me nuts it drives my wife nuts well, I, I would agree with that. If, if people could only understand that in this country, 10,000 dogs and cats are slaughtered every day in these facilities, and they call them kill shelters, and I'm thinking, that's kind of oxymoronic. It, how, how can it be a shelter if they're killing these things? So they really kind of kill facilities or holding pens for these, an, these poor animals. And I, I look at my numbers, and I'm thinking, I've been at this for three years now. I've flown over 3,000 animals, and people go, attaboy. I'm thinking, you're killing 10,000 a day. Mm -hmm. And the answer is not transporting more. Of course, it's stay and neuter. Mm -hmm. And if we could only get the people to do that, get those backyard breeders to stop doing it, yes. um, and I would have to transport fewer, nothing would make me happier and to have an airplane and no reason to use it. So true. I mean, there's no way around that. That's 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 everything. You know, it's it's dog hoarding. You know, these these pet hoarders out there that have 30, 40 dogs, pretty much half, if not more, emaciated. Some are just dying in the house. I heard of a story the other day where there was a lady who had, I think, like 30 cats, um, some snakes. It was a smell coming out of her apartment that was so bad that next door neighbor, the child, threw up. Police came to the house and found dead animals all throughout the house. She goes, I'm foster parent. I'm trying to help. That's not helping. Yeah, you know, they. a lot of these people start out with the best of intentions, and then they just get in over their head. And, and that's yeah, something we've they, talked about a number of times. It's one thing when you have the one, three, five, but you got to know when there's that limitation. Right. So, yeah. Well, I really appreciate it. Now, if I appreciate your time so much, um, how can people get involved to donate to help you out? Well, they can go to our Facebook page, Dog is My Co Pilot Inc. Okay. Uh, they'll see. Uh, a link to donate, or they can go to our web page. But we uh, we take anything, anything helps. Five dollars helps. I mean, that'll buy a, a one gallon of ab gas for us. We have a program for where we, uh, as we refer to as squadron members, where you can sign up and have ten dollars a month charged to your credit card automatically. I mean, honestly, you think about it. That that's a couple cups of coffee at Starbucks. It is. And you're saving animals. And we have we have a lot of five dollar a month donors, a lot of ten dollar a month donors. But it takes a lot of donors to get this done. It's just and the more people who can help, the better whatever they can afford. There is no dollar amount that's too small. We're we're appreciative of that. If they if they make a donation I'm happy to send them a license plate frame that says "Dog is my co-pilot" with our our logo and our web page on website on it. And I will put in the description on the show whether you're listening to this on YouTube or you have it on iTunes or whatever your device you're using. I will have the full description on any way possible to get in touch with "Dog is my co-pilot," and it will be in the show notes. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you for everything you do. I mean, you are literally a hero of mine. Yeah, but you're a team member too. We're all we got to get more people on the team. I, well, that's that's the hope and the goal. Yeah, you know, they say if you can't if you can't foster volunteer, if you can't volunteer, donate. We, so, you know, that's the funny part. We, we try to lead by example. We do all of those things, and we just hope that if we can just turn somebody, one person around, 
give them that little bit of information, then that person will then pay it forward and pay it forward and keep going. Right. That's the hope. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank Peter, you for so much time. for your time. I really enjoyed chatting with you. And uh, I want you to say go Cubs. Oh, go Cubs for sure. If they can take out our Cardinals, <laughs> I'm okay with it. Yep, the team you lose to, you want to take all the marbles. You really do, actually. <laughs> I, I think that every yeah. every sport, every season, every time, that's my that's my way. If they're going to take my team yeah. out, then hey, you're you're not. We want you to go all the way. Right. Thank you very hey, much. Hey, thank you so much. All right, you have a great afternoon. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. Well, there goes Peter Rourke with Take It Off Again. We thank you very much for actually joining us this week on the podcast. Um, Doug is my co-pilot, has been a, a real amazing organization that I've been looking at for a while now and wanting to get him on the podcast. Just, you know, with this year not being able to do any kind of interviews because of my schedule, it's just been kind of hard to actually do anything. So I finally was able to actually knock off somebody from my list that I wanted to talk to and learn a lot more, which I didn't expect to learn this much. It was quite entertaining. I do want to say I'm sorry for not being a part of that interview, um, but it makes it very difficult when there's two hosts and one guest the way we do it. So um, definitely appreciate all you guys were talking about. I was at all the entire time just listening to everything we had to say. I mean, you know, he they've helped over 3,000 pets, and if they were, you know, $75 a pet to do it, basically, you know, that's over $255,000 um, that had to be funded to save these animals. And I was just, just wow. <laughs> I, I, you know, my takeaway was what an overachiever he is. He, you know, and I see that in a good way. You know, here's, here's somebody who... It was like, you know, I could fly a plane. Now, when I was 16, 17, I wasn't able to fly a plane. And I'm 34, and I still can't fly a plane. But the way he just was like, and then I was accepted into medical school. It's, I was just like, that, that's, that's a feat right there in itself. That, that took a lot of work and, and nothing to, to, to look at. He took it as, well, you know, I achieved it, and I... I couldn't look at that without just respect. It was like, wow. I was, when I was listening and, and hearing him say how, you know, he had his pilot's license before his driver's license, and then being a pl- pilot wasn't as stimulating anymore, so therefore he went to a medical school, I was taken back. Wow, you know, good for you. You knew exactly what you wanted. You went and did it and yeah, achieved this is, it. Yeah, this is a driven person, and... and in no way he was he's always been driven and it's it's one of those i this guy's done more in one year than i feel like i've been able to do it and i love to be able to talk to people like that because it's people like this that you you got to look at it and go wow and the other part that really you know stuck with me after listening to it is the part where he you know after his his wife passed and sorry to hear about that, our condolences. Um, after his wife passed, he didn't have the heart for medicine anymore and he went into the rescue. Um, and how he went from one you know, career of cleaning up after other people's mess to now doing rescues and such, you're still you know, cleaning up other people's messes. Yep. People's messes are back Backyard breeders, um, if you have a dog and you think, oh, this dog would have such cute puppies, oh, we need to find her a male to have cute yeah. puppies, that is a backyard breeder. You don't need those. There is nowhere, you're just, you're just stro- stroking your own ego because you want your cute little puppy to have puppies. How cute would they be? Okay, well, you don't have to deal with them when they're older. You don't have to deal with those puppies when they're 10, 11, 12 years old. You don't have to make sure that each and every single one of them are fixed. Um, You don't have to make sure all those puppies are vaccinated and homed properly for their entire life, not just a few years here and there, and then shelter life. No, you don't have to, but 
you get to satisfy your own you know few months of oh isn't this <laughs> cute no it's not cute it's it's horrifying I just hope that people will realize that spay and neuter is our biggest problem that we have because it's just overpopulating and it, we've said this oh my gosh the countless of times but you know it's it's bad enough with dogs but it's even worse with cats how they can they can have multiple litter you know multiple suitors for a litter they can they have a lot quicker heat where they can actually have more litters throughout the year than a dog there is just so many things so it's the spay and neutering is number one knowing knowing what dog and we, we we talked about that during the interview knowing what dog you're going to adopt knowing it's it's health issues knowing what you're getting into if you have if you have do your research yeah if you have allergies get a dog that's hypoallergenic that'll help you if your life is rocky you don't know where you're going to be living the uh -huh. next year you don't know what's going on don't get a dog no and and I have to say this. I I, I have, before I even go any further, before I forget, I have to thank Judy Zimmett for actually responding to my message. She was so prompt. She was able to get that message out to Peter so quickly, and it was just I couldn't believe that. Just oh okay, well let me let me contact him and it, so quick. You're you are actually so amazing as well. Everything that you do, you handle so much for Dog is my co-pilot. You deserve a lot of credit you're an amazing person and thank you for all that you did and your responses and everything it sounds like their drive for this their passion for this is like if they just started it yesterday right yeah their passion is still as as, as strong as it was then as well yeah um they've been doing this for a couple years like you said three years i think they finally got down the proper um uh, what they say formula yeah. on how many dogs to transfer to where um, I think it's amazing how uh, you take dogs from one shelter that is just they're being executed left and right to a place where you know they don't have that problem so they could take more right um, I think you said Boise Idaho was one of the ones yep. that took in quite a bit we have him he was going to Utah he was going to Boise he was going to a lot of different places I mean the seven day you know kill shelters I mean it's just they shouldn't put the word shelter in it they it's shouldn't no it's not a shelter it's 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 a death it's like death row like a, a holding cell yeah it's terrible it's it, oh, oh <clears throat> that's it's one, of, one of the things I really love about the Rolla animal shelter is that um, yes they do euthanize but it is so seldom yeah. that it's only for particular reasons. And we have a lot of problem with pets out here. We have a lot of problem with, with people not neutering their dogs or fixing their dogs. We have a lot of problems with backwards breeders or backyard breeders. And then we have a lot of kennel um, kennel mill or puppy mills. Puppy mills. You also have dog fighting that you'll hear about um, that kind of runs through and then you know runs two right dogs out. Two dogs standing in the back of a truck like that. Yep. That's, That's always me. so annoying. Uh, especially but, if you see them on a highway where they're they're open bed and the draw the they're going 60, 70 miles an hour and a dog is just barely hanging on for dear life. It's, it's terrible. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. So it's you know, please folks check out their website try to get involved even if it's a little bit just try to get involved and help these guys out because these they're really the ones that are doing the best work out there and what's what was great for me to listen to and hear is how he acknowledged the the shelters and that housed them the the fosters the organizations that put it together um he gave quite a few shout outs to quite a few people that he's thankful for um and he says how he is, you know, he's there to help, but he's not the hero here. Oh, and no, then, no. You know, he needs to know he is. Yeah, very much so. He needs to take the credit. Um, but it is true. We ourselves are thankful for people like John Redshaw. Yep. Um, and all the other folks, Roy, uh, all of them over at the shelter that go out and they help these animals, and not just dogs and cats. Oh yeah, um, all kinds of animals. All kinds of relocates them, um, puts them in a safer spot. They do whatever they can do to preserve their life. And, and, 
what's great about what we're doing, you know, we're involved in so many different organizations and we get to talk to a lot of different people all over the country and we're able to kind of get a little bit more insight to what's going on. Just, you know, Peter obviously sees a lot more and gets a lot more uh, than what we get of insight, but we see it from a, a very large picture of, of the problems that are out there. The problems that people just are kind of passing off as whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, maybe that's why the podcast is what it is because we talk about it each week. We share these stories each week of different things and, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to actually think that so many animals will die this week just because of ignorance. And if most of them were probably going to be the best dogs or cats out there and they won't make it through the end of the week because just there's no home for them. Yep. And yeah, it's just terrible. But it's, um, it is very upsetting when you look in at that part. How do you stop it? Educate. Yeah. Educate the people. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'm very congested right now, so it's extremely hard to talk. <laughs> we have people here in Missouri who are the good old boys who do not care about the life of an animal, who will not go and neuter a dog because they're taking away their genitals. Um, they have that sick attachment to their dog's genitals. I don't understand. But um, try to educate them. But what's most likely going to happen is that they're, they're so dense they don't care. It's like when we got um, the, our foster kitten from. They're just going to kill it. Well, that's how too much of life is in, you know, places called country. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, but try to educate. Get involved. If you can't get involved, then foster. Yeah. If you can't foster, donate. Yep. Just like you said. And the whole cycle, there's plenty of people that donate their time because they don't have the funds to donate. Um, and then there's plenty of people that donate funds but don't have the time to donate so it takes everybody to help do what you can it's really not that big of a deal to help five dollars ten dollars just just here and there whenever you can skip your one latte a week i mean it can help and it can make a difference it can um to find out more information about dog is my co-pilot please check out the show notes in our description uh we will have website we will have facebook postings and you can actually read a little bit more about peter rourke and his organization well i'm chris green have a petastic week and i'm sarah green making sure everybody realizes life is so short play the pet claire have a good day with your pet goodbye bye bye everybody okay gotta go in my bedtime Worst episode ever. Rest assured that I was on the internet within minutes, registering my disgust throughout the world.